Hi everyone, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella, my secrets. My name is Coco Gem Holiday. How are you doing tonight, Coco? Um, I've been really focused on cultural appropriation. No, seriously, that's not what I've been focusing on at all. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I actually started watching Midnight Gospel. Oh yeah, yeah, I love it. I'm on episode three. Um, mm-hmm. Number one, they talk a lot. Yeah, <laughs> so they do. Like a so lot of it's interesting because like it's set to a podcast, but also animated, and um, a lot of the times the animation doesn't match what's happening with the sound, and it's supposed to be purposely jarring yeah it's um <laughs> so the first episode obviously with the zombie apocalypse uh-huh was very distracting yeah <laughs> from the conversation that was so distracting that i lost it yeah but in the second one it wasn't really jarring as much as it was disgusting yeah and so i could focus on the podcast more because like i don't want to watch this. yeah yeah definitely and then the third one it's actually kind of a interesting mix yeah. it's about the one about uh magic and mm-hmm. Um, I liked that the guy one. with the fish bowl head and whatever, mm-hmm. and like the cats. <laughs> yeah, isn't it interesting? I mean, maybe one day we'll have um, a budget to animate our podcast after it reaches massive amounts of success. You know, mm-hmm. upon the um, tens of viewers that listen to it now. <laughs> The tens of viewers. <laughs> the ones of users. Is, is that what it would be called? The ones of users. Oh my goodness. But thank you for everybody. I actually, yes. We're actually getting a growth in downloads of our podcast. So for all of you that um, have downloaded, we'll say it right now. Please go to... Um, I. Find our podcast on Apple iTunes and rate us a five, maybe. That really helps us out and it gets us seen and it gets us noticed. Uh, Please make sure to share our website, agemofasecretpodcast.com. Gem is spelled J-E-M. Yeah. Did I say viewers? I meant listeners. (laughs) Um, I love you, viewers. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, uh, check us out on all of those platforms that you listen to listen to podcasts on uh, specifically Apple Podcasts because it does really help us out and as we've been doing this we've just kind of been learning and adding more and more as we learn how to become podcasters because this isn't something that we had a bunch of skill sets in um, doing before we started Mm -hmm. Um, quarantine really got the ball rolling for us to where we um, started focusing more on the podcast but it's been very fun to focus on and very fun to uh, just produce more and more content for all of y'all that listen to us. Yeah, definitely. And it's a lot easier than um, actually full performance, but it uh, the introspection and the conversation that we get to have is really enlightening for me. Again, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm fully tucked. I'm wearing a full <laughs> wig right now. <laughs> I have all the geesh on. <laughs> Speaking of podcasts, actually, um, we're going to touch on a subject that affected our community recently, um, specifically more on a general side because we don't actually want to gain notoriety for negative incidents. Mm-hmm. But we had a member of our community um, who apparently way back in the day, um, you know, we all have learning experiences that we go through and sometimes we might be trouble, sometimes we might be positive. But um, a drag race girl talked about one of the members of our community on their podcast. Yeah. And um, obviously they have a lot of listeners and a lot of notoriety with that and this incident apparently happened many 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 years ago yeah and this person is not that person anymore yeah it's problematic to use a platform especially when you're someone who has a wide audience of listeners or in this person's case uh viewers because they're you know they are They were on television. They also have a very established social media presence. Um, To go on and uh, slander an entertainer. Well, I mean, and, you know, maybe it's not slander, but it's still to bring up negative happenings of an entertainer's past especially if you haven't seen or talked to that entertainer in many years. Yeah, and what hurts about this is they actually said the entertainer's name, full drag name. Yeah, it would be something else to allude to it, like we are right now. Yeah. Because honestly, like, I mean, there there are quite a few Rue girls that have podcasts nowadays. And in fact, there's a lot of drag queens nowadays that have podcasts. So, Mm -hmm. like, people can't really you know, go and discern unless they're part of our community and saw kind of what happened with it. Um, They can't really discern who we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And the reason that we wanted to talk about that is because we have one of our topics today is cancel culture. Mm -hmm. But going back specifically to this podcast, 
One thing that hurts me about it is, and I've, I've really had to look at myself and really check my ego here. So as you all know that me and Donna are from Grand Junction, Colorado, and I have a lot of negative moments from that place. I have a lot of positive ones, of course, like I met my husband there. However, when I'm talking about Grand Junction, it's a very specific incident, mm -hmm. uh, like it's a specific moment in my life. Mm -hmm. I don't really ever try to say the names of people who did me wrong or, you know, or try to talk about establishments in a negative way yeah. if I'm going to say something negative. I mean, even when we did our episodes on Grand Junction, we didn't bring up the people's names specifically that mm -hmm. affected us in those yeah. in those negative incidents. Yeah, and so overall, I'm going to rate that podcast as being tacky. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if there was a tacky rating on Apple Podcasts, mm -hmm. tacky would be what they deserve. Tacky, definitely. Very tacky. And I just, I don't know. I think that it's really important that we know that... Um, call out culture and it's not just cancel culture it's also mm -hmm. call out culture mm -hmm. if you're going to call out someone by name on a public forum mm -hmm. you have to be prepared to not only receive a response from that person because i believe that everyone should be critiqued on what they say publicly if if they decide to take it to that level um right. but if you bring personal drama to a public forum then you should not only be prepared prepared for their response, but also to possibly face backlash from other people for your choice to do so. Exactly. And I think that people people forget that free speech isn't the freedom to say whatever you want. Free speech is the freedom to say whatever you want with consequences. Yes. <laughs> yes. That That's part. The free, like, because, yeah, um, literally, you can say whatever you want, but it doesn't mean that somebody's not going to come around and say something negative to your face. Like, that's why people, so terms like gaslighting and cancel culture and call out culture are really like, um, they're really hot button items right now mm -hmm. because people use cancel culture or like, um, as the phrase used to be, the court of public opinion yes. when you felt like you received this great injustice mm -hmm. and this is your only way of getting back on top. But when you think about it, like a lot of those books, like even like the four agreements and things like that mm -hmm. will tell you that like, these are the things that you shouldn't be focusing on. Yeah. Like if somebody does you wrong, um, not even legally, it just does you wrong. They hurt your feelings. It doesn't mean that you need to go online and completely slander their character and end up being the bully that you are trying to avoid. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I think also, I mean, especially with the times that we're in, call-out culture is something that we're seeing more and more of with more people being online nowadays. I mean, you see more people judging people for their decisions that they're making in day-to-day mm -hmm. -day life. And, I mean, it's easy to do because there are a lot of people that aren't following some of these orders that have been put in place. Yeah. But um, I, I also think that sometimes minding your own business is nice. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it is. Like, you don't always have to, it, like, you don't always have to say something. You don't. And you can scroll past. Like, um, that unfollow button is a blessing. Oh, my gosh. Yes. <laughs> and also, there's another thing I want to say, though. Although I really like the unfollow feature, and I use it constantly. I love the unfollow <laughs> feature because, like, the second I get something that's annoying, I'm just like, oh, don't want to see your shit anymore. <laughs> but um, I think that maybe... As um, people, we need to stop taking the block feature or when people unfriend us as a personal attack oh. on us. Oh, gosh, I, I don't... We didn't talk about this subject before we started the podcast, <laughs> and I have to really unpack that, so keep talking while I unpack. Um, I think that we need to not take it as, like, a personal attack on us because this... This the reason why someone is doing that. They don't really owe you an explanation, first of all, for why they're doing it. It could it, like if they're doing it, they're doing it to protect themselves from Ooh. some sort of energy or something that they don't want in their life. And they honestly do not owe us an explanation if it does happen. I had it happen to me the other day and I it like I fixated on it and I was like, what in the fuck? Like, what did I do? Oh, my gosh. Um, I, I'm like, like, I'm literally unpacking two boxes right now. Uh -huh. uh, so the first one is. When people unfriend you, and uh -huh. Donna had a really great quote the last, um, our last podcast too, which uh -huh. I just super appreciated. Um, the and I'm going to say it again for this one because it was so great. The um, I like to perform, but I love to get paid to perform. Yes, great quote. <laughs> this so this episode, the whole um, if somebody unfriends you, um, it might not be a personal attack. Yeah, so it's number one, and um, seriously, and the un, if you unfollow somebody or unfriend somebody it might be a self-defense mechanism for yourself yeah 
those are really big ideas that I have to unpack quite a bit because I <laughs> no because I feel personally attacked when somebody unfriends me. Yeah, I I don't know. I feel like I feel like it happened to me the other day, and I really like I saw myself spiraling, and I saw what it was doing to myself, and um. I feel like it's really easy for it to be like, well, obviously this person hates me or something like that. You know, like they, they really have a problem with me. Sometimes people are just in a place where they can't take or really digest what it is you're putting out there on social media. And if they can't express that to you now, that's their way of showing that they need to remove themselves from the situation for a little bit. Who knows? Maybe they'll add you back on Facebook or you'll run into them in person and you'll have a nice, pleasant conversation with them. But I think for that time being, it's something that I've had to do, too, when I see things that I don't really like on my timeline. I can understand why people wouldn't want to see it, you know? Yeah, I yeah, I definitely get it. I'm, I'm still unpacking, so yeah. I can't even comment on it. Yeah. Like, because I don't want to miss, misspeak, like, if I, if I definitely change my views on it. The thing is, so I'll have to talk about personally for when I unfriend. So when I unfriend somebody, it's... Um, and I do mean unfollow on all social media and unfriend them, not blocking yet. When I unfriend somebody, it's just because, one, I'm getting too close to my 5,000 limit on Facebook, but then it's also because, like, this person didn't bring me joy. Like, I'm a recondo my friends list. So I'm mm-hmm. like, and I, if I unfriend somebody, because it happens very rarely, um, that's part of the reason that I do it. Yeah. And then the other side of it, when I, uh, when I, block somebody i usually block somebody because their content is so vitriol for me that i just can't deal with it yeah um and so yeah i get so i guess i do get the self-defense mechanism Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i guess it's hard for me to see that in the moment when it's happening it is it is it's extremely like like i I said i I was spiraling when i found out about someone and the thing is like it was so it was someone that i've i've talked to um kind of romantically in a sense Like, when, around the time that I moved here, and, like, I, you know, like, it was, it's a person that I haven't met in person, but we've had nice conversations outside Mm. of, um, like, the dating apps and stuff. So we've texted and stuff like that, and, um, I, I don't really understand why, and I, I know that it would drive me crazy if I tried to right now at this time, Mm -hmm. but I know this time is really stressful for a lot of people, and maybe... My um, overwhelming positivity that I've been trying to post on Facebook (laughs) is too much for this person. (laughs) Yeah. And so um, I do want to round out this segment um, because obviously we have a first segment now because we're like so famous. Um, So the cancel culture (laughs) stuff, um, I actually want to be, I want to play devil's advocate for a second. Um, Because we rarely do that here where we jump sides. But I think it's important because we had a semi-cancel culture-y thing happened here in Portland recently. And I bet some of my friends are like, how dare she not agree with what I said on the internet? The fact is, like, I think there is kind of a time and a place for call-outs if it's done respectfully. So this is my rule. This is Coco's Mm -hmm. rules for call-out. So let's say it's something that's obviously wrong, not just like a cultural appropriation, but like, say somebody posts a meme of, let's do this, because everybody's going to do this. Somebody posted a meme of like an animal getting hurt, Mm -hmm. right? So it's wrong. It's, you were triggered by it. Nobody should have posted that. And so my first and foremost rule, number one, write the person privately being like, hey friend, like I saw this thing that you posted and I just wanted to let you know, like, that's really triggering. That's awful to see animals getting hurt. Um, you know, like, I'm, I'm really not on board with what you're writing and see what they do with it. If they mm-hmm. attack you back, sure, have that argument all privately because that's fine for it to be privately. But then if they end up saying something to you, they, like, say something racist to you in that, like, immediately you want to go to your Facebook with screenshots and receipts. By the way, for anybody older, like my mom who might be listening to this, receipts are when you take a screenshot of when somebody says something to you. You take a screenshot of it with your cell phone, and so you have those receipts of the interaction. Mm-hmm. It's a cover your ass court kind of thing. Yeah. Anyway, so my rule number two is, so even if they get dirtier, you go high. You Michelle Obama it. Like, yeah. You yeah. don't need to immediately go to posting it like all these kind of ways or whatever. So the only time that I actually really believe in call out culture is if the first thing is they post something super racist. Like, so if they actually post something like I adamantly will say the N word to your face, I don't think that we should be blocking words. 
Yeah, share that stuff. Share be like they posted it publicly. That's yeah, their own day. Yeah, cloud. they're the ones who are acting <laughs> stupid online. <laughs> yeah, like that's and then you can share that all day long. And then of course, if something's happening with your government, um, you should be sharing articles about stuff like that because oh, yeah. you want people to be informed. And that's not a call out culture. That's sharing information. Yeah. So I guess maybe I don't agree. So call out culture, I don't really agree with, and I don't really agree with cancel culture because it ends with people having really strong mental wellness issues yeah so and we've been on the receiving end of it before yeah Hopefully. and it's, it's not fun it's definitely been a little terrible yeah. um oh sorry just um because i'm terrible i need to say donna how are you doing this evening oh you know what i will let you know right after this brief commercial break have you ever been drunk off your ass at a gay bar during a drag show and thought you know what i can do that that's too hard Maybe if I control the yellow shots, I can have more for myself. Then have we got a show for you. Cooking Up a Queen, a brand new limited series brought to you by the CD Studios. Over the course of a 10-week run, you'll be brought into the flagrant and fanciful world of queer nightlife, with Camp One and Kiki finalist Coco Jim Holiday and rising star of the Portland drag scene, Touche Douche. These two will delve deep into what it takes to be a drag entertainer, the do's and don'ts of newcomers on the scene, as well as discuss topics that you would never think would come up until you're a cross-dresser on the corner of 5th and Broadway. Trust me, you're going to want to pay special attention for that one because, um, it's a lot. Make sure to tune in starting May 31st every Sunday for Cooking Up a Queen, available wherever you podcast. It's a podcast. Check it out. With Coco and Don, a telepodcast. Tune into what they tell you podcast. Check it out. With Coco and Don, a telepodcast. Check it out. Well, Coco, I'll let you know that I am feeling very excited. I'm very pepped. And I don't know if it was just our new transition music that Party Favors just brought us that we um, played for y'all and you'll hear in our podcast from here on out, but also because we're discussing a lot of taboo topics tonight. And this is part one of our Taboo Topics podcast. Um, So the next thing that we want to talk about is going to be um, the drugs and alcohol that are kind of present within the drag community. Yeah, so let's actually take a brief walk down drag herstory lane. Um, Drugs and alcohol are very ingrained in drag society, and I know that people would probably immediately want to be defensive about that comment, but the fact is, like, those New York scenes way back in the day, and, you know, drugs were... I mean, even RuPaul has a special about it, about Mm -hmm. how she was on, like, Uppers, Downers, and Candy Candy Corn. Yeah, yeah. It's... It's true, like drugs and alcohol are very ingrained in our system. And so positively speaking, and actually, and on a level today, uh, most drag entertainers sometimes only get paid in drink tickets. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. The thing is, um, for me personally, I'm just going to add this, uh, drag hurts for me being overweight. It really does. Mm -hmm. And like in high heels are just a nightmare in general. And so like uh, a couple of cocktails, like, eases every like little bit of pain oh my before i learned about open toe tights i remember my feet would be throbbing and the only way to get through a night would be to drink alcohol so then i didn't feel like i wanted to chop both my feet off yeah it seriously is a big thing we're gonna be talking like generally like because i know that we have a lot of people in our families who may be listening to this i'm not we're not gonna like admit to like what we may or may not have done but we're gonna just talk about um these specific issues and and because mm-hmm. some of them are not are not really even issues so let's like even go with the fun one like so like poppers for instance oh yes poppers are very like open in the queer scene they are and <laughs> have been for a while i by the way a little side note I saw a video of, what's her name from uh, Golden Girls? Blanche. Blanche. uh, Doing poppers as like a comedy skit uh, dressed as a nun. (laughs) It was hilarious. That's great. It was great. But this, I mean, this was back in like the early 90s. So yeah, I mean, poppers have been a part of culture for a long time. And that's, you know, that goes, it's kind of synonymous. It's synonymous with sex. Yeah. So. It really is. And, um. And then, of course, let's go over to cocaine. So here's the thing about cocaine is cocaine seems to be very prevalent in drag communities. Yeah. Um, I'll tell a story about when um, 
I was doing an out of town booking when I was still an early queen. Like, um, we heard this phrase, like, does anybody want to go skiing? And I, I was just that. like, I was like, what are you talking about? And then like, they did this like finger with their nose and their hand and whatever and their finger. Like, I was like, oh, yeah, like cocaine. Cause I'm, I'm a baby queen. Cocaine. <laughs> oh, is that what you're talking about? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> just yell out loud. Cocaine. <laughs> In the middle of the club. Mm-hmm. No, um, yeah, it, it, I think the reason why um, it is so prevalent, though, is because if you have too much to drink, it's always been known as a quick way to jumpstart your night again. And that may be a, a reason why it is so prevalent. Another drug that we see that is prevalent mostly in, like, gay male communities is the use of steroids. Yeah, definitely. Um, and we all heard about that cherry pie scandal. Trying to maintain a impossibly attainable physique. Yeah, it, it's so weird. You know that, you've seen that meme though, the meme that talks about what I want to look like and it's like a bodybuilder uh-huh. and then like what I'm attracted to is the next picture and it's like a dad bod. Yeah. Like, <laughs> bitch, I, I literally, I was like lifting weights in my room nonstop, like every, and I have had time to do nothing else and I was doing it, I was like trying to build up my chest and and I'm like, gosh, there's I'm just like not seeing any results. <laughs> like, like I know that I want that instant gratification in two weeks is not a long time to do it, but mm-hmm. I'm like, god damn, this is rough. Like I want to have this unattainable physique that I feel like I'm never gonna reach. And sometimes I just have to like recognize that I will always be a lanky, awkward white boy. Mm-hmm. And that's that's just it. <laughs> You know, and so let's talk about the harsher stuff. Like, so let's talk about meth, for instance. And it's really prevalent in our scenes as well, especially in drag queer communities. It was especially when we were in Grand Junction as well. Yeah, it that definitely was. The was. Main. I mean, we didn't we didn't see much of the other things because it yeah. was so prevalent where we were from. Um, yeah, and it's it's also synonymous with um, group sex. Group sex, yeah. The thing is, like, it's very easy. As someone who has struggled in the past with, you know, a substance here or there, um, mm-hmm. I'm not going to say what, and I'm going to be very vague about it. I, I could just be alluding to alcohol, so don't draw any conclusions. And I used to struggle with some of these things, and it's it's not, like, a, like, great place to be in. So there is always resources if you want to go out and get help. Um, there's places to go for drug treatment. There's also a lot of LGBT support groups specifically. Um, luckily, um, that we, since we live in a bigger queer city than what we had before, um, mm-hmm. there's a lot more resources that are geared towards people who are part yeah, of the Yeah, and actually, as, I, as you're saying that, just as a side note, in Grand Junction, there, there was um, opportunities for people to get help and to get better, mm-hmm. but it wasn't always in the best of queer-friendly spaces. No. And and so, like, it is great being in a city to where if I wanted to fall off that bandwagon hard, mm-hmm. um, that there are resources here that will not necessarily judge me because of my sexual orientation and gender. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely. actually kind of really cool to think about. And one thing I want to say about that is the reason it's prevalent in our scenes is you have to remember what drag really is for those of you who are listening. Um, drag didn't start in the high glam RuPaul's Drag Race season 11. Mm-hmm. Drag was hey, um, you dress like a woman and you have the ability to party until four in the morning in my scene. Yeah. Um, I need you to come and like serve drinks. I need you to come and dance and be weird. I need you to come and talk with people, make out with strangers and all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, um, and like, you know, be the life of the party, um, you know, five nights a week. Mm-hmm. Like drag wasn't always like you do, you know, one show on the weekend and you make $5,000. Yeah. It was like you work and you live in a crappy apartment with a dirty mattress and you go for it. Cause you love doing it. You love performing, you love entertaining, you love mm-hmm. people. And that's what drag kind of was. in like in the RuPaul area, a little RuPaul era, a little bit. Yeah. Um, and there's obviously history to that. And which is not what this episode's about. We're talking about drugs and alcohol. Yeah. But you have to just remember it's really ingrained in our scene because people, People aren't judged in the drag queer scene for the drugs that they do. No, they're not, um, because it is so prevalent. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it's important to talk about this because we need to, because it it is a it is a true it it drug. The fact is, hard drugs lead to issues later on down the line. Yeah, they will with Mm -hmm. your health if you um, over 
indulge in hard drugs. It's just going to be what happens. So it's important to recognize that, yes, although it may be part of the scene and it all, although it may be normalized because it's been around for years, there are resources if anyone is struggling um, to get help with that. And um, you know what? We'll provide some of those resources on our website as well um, at yeah. gemofasecretpodcast.com. So there's plenty of resources for people to go to because the fact of the matter is we don't want to glamorize this lifestyle as like something to be proud of if you're in this like hole of um, addiction or or feeling like you're in despair or anything like that. There is always a way out of it and there is always a way to triumph and tell your story later on to where you can inspire people to do the same. Um, so it's 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 not a dead end place to be. Yeah, and actually I want to talk about something that's actually really interesting about this specific subject. Mm -hmm. So I used to believe um, when I was a young baby queen, and this is probably within my first year, I used to really get mad at people who would praise folks uh, who would be kicking drug habits. Mm. Like they're now, dr uh, they're now cocaine free, they're now meth free, um, and stuff like that. And I mm -hmm. used to always be so confused by why people were praising folks doing something they shouldn't have ever done in the first place. Mm. And I know like people hearing this are probably like, oh my God, screw Coco, she's terrible. Um, and to a degree, there's like probably 5% of me that still believes in that. As I've gotten older, I've recognized that the situations that people are in are all different across the board. Yeah. How someone ends up doing hard drugs can be a multitude of reasons. Yeah. It's not just as easy as I said no that time I was asked by Chad in high school. Yeah. Like, there's so many reasons that people start drugs, and there's a million reasons why people continue them, and there's usually one reason that people stop. Mm -hmm. And it's because even if you're doing it for someone else, it's because you want to you want to kick it you yeah. want to be better you are sick and tired of this lifestyle and you recognize that there is a way out like donna said definitely and, and yeah so go ahead yeah. because it is so prevalent you can find so much more support in these communities in the drag communities in the queer communities because the fact of the matter is likely one in three of us have struggled with yeah some sort of agreed substance yeah i issue. super agree with that because so my stance nowadays is it is not my place to judge someone um, for the actions of how they got to where they are. It is my job to help boost a positive outcome to what somebody is doing with their life. Yeah. Um, because I, I loved, I listened to a, um, a YouTube special recently that talked about what meth looks like in adults. And it was, um, it was talking about how it's not always just the person who's like, sitting you know in a tent down on the street or whatever wow. asking for money it's the mom who has three kids who they all need things and she has to work a full-time job and she needs to just stay up for a couple of days mm -hmm. and whatever and this helps her make her feel better and nobody knows that she's even doing it because she's keeping it together mm -hmm. like it's a drag entertainer who needs to perform an like a drastic number five nights in a row to be able to like keep food on their table and a roof over their head. Yeah. So as much as drugs always come off in the drag community as being glamorous and glitzy and all these mm -hmm. other things, it's also a coping mechanism and it's a habit that we hopefully want to get people to kick. Now, the fact is we do know that like those party drugs exist and whatever like that and how people really recognize that in the community can be different from person to person. My mm -hmm. thing is, um, you know, drugs are bad. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's <laughs> let's help each other with that. Like yeah. instead of judgment and shame, um, push and boost and amplify and yeah. help. And because a lot of these um, substances are synonymous with um, group casual sex in in some cases, we're gonna talk about knowing your status and what that means. Practicing safe sex. Yeah, definitely. Because um, remember, this is a two-part taboo series. So what we want to talk about, we're going to talk about safe sex for a second. Mm -hmm. um, funny part is, because I know that was all really heavy. Funny story. Like, it's so weird when you get hit on in drag by, like, that straight dude who wants his quote-unquote offensive term, like, fantasy mm -hmm. um, and whatever. And, like, and... <laughs> 
it like comes after you and i'm like do you know what i look like underneath this i am balls of tights sweat for days yeah i smell like a garbage can yeah. <laughs> and you want this mm-hmm. like good heavens Mm -hmm. so it's really important so so that's just a funny story to make it a little bit more light but it is really important for all queer people actually anyone in general to really know your status i mean it's Mm -hmm. okay to get tested there should be no shame in getting tested yeah yeah there really shouldn't be and um you know it's just important to know that like no matter what happens while you're getting tested because we all know how how um anxiety inducing oh my gosh yes that no matter what happens, there are so many options out there for people, whether or not they are positive, whether or not your your partner is and you're not, there is ways to live a happy and healthy life with a positive diagnosis or um, if you're someone whose partner is positive and, and you may not be as well. There are a lot of advancements that have been made in this um, aspect of the HIV and AIDS um, yeah, crisis. Yeah, because HIV is not a death sentence. And I know that that sounds like just, you know, words at the mouth. Mm-hmm. But I actually, you know, let's dive just a tad bit deeper, real, real fast. The fact is, when you're in that moment, when you're in that specific moment, when you're finally in bed with somebody who's like a 10 and you're a six and whatever, and nobody brought any condoms and whatever, and they're just super hot. And you're just like, I would like to be able to go through this moment. It's super hard for a person to say no. And I'm talking about consensually. I'm Mm -hmm. not talking about non-consensual. This is all consensual conversation. The fact is sometimes it happens and it happens to the best of us Mm -hmm. and it happens with just one time and you don't recognize it. Yeah. Um, And so the fact is, it's just important for you to know your status, get tested and get tested often. Yeah. Um, If you have health insurance, look at getting on prep. Yeah. You know, getting on prep. There's all sorts of options out there nowadays and it's a whole different world to where we can go about practicing safe and communicative sex and that's the biggest thing is like we should not feel ashamed as gay men about talking about sex because it is honestly quite a big part of our lives it really is and i actually think for me personally and i know this kills it for everybody else i um would adamantly ask people about their status i don't think that it kills the mood i know you guys out there are going to automatically think that it does but it doesn't um it's not even to open the conversation of condomless sex it's literally to just know yeah hey what's your status and not even just gay men the queer community in general i know that you and i i mean gay men sometimes it doesn't always fit the um identifier for me but there are plenty of um, there are plenty of resources for the queer community as far as um, practicing safe sex goes, and that's just it's important to know about. So you know, it's not just condoms anymore. There are all sorts of contraceptives and resources for people to live happy, healthy lives, um, regardless of their status and regardless of identi- how they identify. Exactly, and recognizing too that. If you do happen to go get a test and you happen to pop positive, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. It doesn't mean that you're dirty and it doesn't mean that you're living a life um, that you shouldn't be living. Like, the fact of the matter is, anything can happen to any single one of us at any given moment. Definitely. So we take each of life's challenges and we make the best life possible from you know what we're given and that's kind of the message we wanted to have from that because um knowing your status is just super 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 important in the queer community Mm -hmm. it just is and it shouldn't kill the vibe seriously why somebody you're making out with somebody in a couch just be like what's your status yeah 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 and also being being open about the fact that you know what like there will be people that you come across that have a positive diagnosis and understanding what that truly means. Understanding that when someone is at undetectable, that means they are also not transmittable. So yeah. And that's, I'm glad that we said that here. Um, even Donna had admitted to me that she didn't know that actually. I didn't um, for the longest time. I, it wasn't until probably about like a year or a year and a half ago that I, I knew that undetectable meant not transmittable. Yeah. And even with PrEP having all the things about the long term, like bone density loss and all those other things, I still think that you should talk to your doctor Mm -hmm. um, about PrEP and, you know, really recognize those concerns and not just immediately throw it off. And my biggest actually hurdle with this is I was on PrEP for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I I really want to say out there 
just because someone's on prep does not mean that they're a whore and doesn't mm-hmm. mean they're a hoe. It doesn't mean that they're sexually irresponsible. Most people that I have found to be on prep um, are actually a lot more sexually irresponsible than people who are not taking it. Yeah. Um, because the only thing you can know, and I used to say this all the time, the only thing you can know for 100% is your own status. Yeah. And your own sexual needs, your own sexual precautions. Yeah. So just to keep in mind, please never shame someone for taking PrEP because they're taking charge of their own sexuality. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. We're going to move on to our Feed the Positive segment. So the first person that we'd like to bring up for the Feed the Positive this week is the Touche Douche. That's how you'll find her on Instagram. Her name is Touche Douche. She's the one who um, did our jingle, our new jingle for this podcast, our intro and our outro. So um, please give her props. Follow her. She's been doing some great things during this time, during quarantine, as far as um, upping her drag and doing new looks and digital performances. Check her out. Follow her on Instagram. We want her to get some more followers um, because she is currently trying to grow her Instagram following. So please go to her account and uh, check her out. She's also Coco's drag daughter. She is. I love her dealer. Durler. Durler. I love her Durler. <laughs> yeah, that's apparently that's the liquor kicking in. Um, and then, of course, our next one is um, the wonderful, talented Nanny Dominatrix, who is absolutely stunning wonderful and is ha- going through some beautiful life affirmations right now on the mm-hmm. internet um it's their story to tell but obviously follow them on instagram at, at party x monster party x monster party x yes, monster that's correct yes and nene is amazing um she did a great little virtual uh drag thing uh titled tantrum that was really cool that was like this little virtual art thing um, and uh, she has some really cool stuff out there. So yeah, check her out too. Yeah, and even and one more thing about Nene is um, she is an absolutely amazing, fantastic singer. One of the places that I felt, not like necessarily like home, but one thing out of drag that I love to do on Monday nights was go to Valentine's Karaoke with Nene Dominatrix and just be able to relax with friends, sit on the patio, eat some amazing vegan pizza, and just like relax and chill. It was like one of my very... <laughs> cool first moments when I first moved to Portland and we will be having an episode here in a few weeks because just like Donna had her one year I'm coming up on my one year yeah here, so um, we'll be talking crazy. about that yeah <laughs> of course three of my months have been in quarantine but anyway uh, <laughs> so yeah that's that's it for this week's episode yeah thank you everyone for listening my name is Donatella my secrets and my name is Coco Gem Holiday we'll catch you next Thursday bye bye, bye. This has been another episode of HM of a Secret Podcast. The hosts of HM of a Secret Podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Jim Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Jim Holiday at Coco Jim Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at The Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a j e m of a secret podcast.com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye.